Hey, how's it going? On this week's pod, we've got a hat trick from Erling, a brace from Sterling, and some Maximan curling. Yeah, it's been another great weekend of Premier League football. Stick around, I think you'll enjoy it. Hello, mate. Welcome back to the Football Diary podcast, where we talk all things Premier League. And I'm going to jump straight in with Dave today and start talking about Manchester City's pretty fantastic 4-2 comeback win against Crystal Palace and Erling Haaland's second half hat-trick. He's really kind of blossoming, isn't he, into an all-round unbeatable striker like he's really a handful for defenses so far and his goal tally is proving pretty impressive isn't it but this game in particular seemed to sort of showcase it all didn't he Dave I was pretty impressed with City generally but they had that focal point now that they've been crying out for ages in Haaland didn't they really yeah and I mean he's really kind of owning you know the penalty boxes movement in and around those areas Uh, really impressive you know we've seen it um, many times in you know short career for Dortmund, but I think you know it seems like that Man City team are really starting to sort of adapt to you know where he likes to operate and you know, where where they should be crossing the ball. Uh, really good goal, for, uh, good ball from Foden for his for his first, and then um, we saw obviously a couple another dimension to him. He played into his feet for his for his hat trick goal and. Um, really good finish. I think teams need to kind of um, be. I think they need to be a little bit tighter in defence. I think they can mm. actually be playing, give it, affording them too much space, especially with that third goal. It almost seemed like he had so much time. I don't know whether that's just because of his, you know, his physique that he manages to court, sort of mm. hold defenders off, but it almost seems like. He did have a bit too much time for that third goal and just to finish like he did. Um, it only looked to be the one result um, when he, you know, that pass was played into him. Yeah, it's but, just so um, physical, isn't it? That's the thing. It's just such a handful. And I think the way he peels off defenders um, and just kind of shrugs them aside and his physical presence in any box is, is just so impressive. And if you don't mark him, he'll punish you. And if you try and mark him, then the other City players punish you as well. Like Bernardo Silva had a great game. So City have got a different dimension now and it's looking pretty pretty frightening. I mean, they gave Crystal Palace a two-goal head start, almost a three-goal head start at one point. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it's ominous really for the rest of the Premier League when they're looking this good. Yeah, I think I think one area they will be concerned about is you know, from conceding from set pieces. Again, both their goals that they conceded were from set pieces. Um, on another day, I think it was all about that first goal that Crystal Palace conceded. As soon as they conceded that goal, it, it seemed like it put them on the back foot and they were really kind of too deep, operating too deep. And I think they just kind of got overran and it, they were they were on the ropes really after that first Bernardo Silva goal was, was scored. And for me, I think the goalkeeper should be saving that. Even it was a took a slight deflection, went into the. It wasn't really still in the corner. Uh, yeah, I thought the goalkeeper reacted quite slowly to that and should have been keeping that out. Uh, yeah, they've given them a two goal head start, and it's not the first time they've they've kind of <laughs> let that happen. Um, and we always used to say about City's mentality in the past, where they went behind and it almost gave them a sense of doubt, didn't it, that they could get back into it or couldn't. And this season so far, they've proved that wrong massively. Yeah, but, um, I think obviously the encouraging thing is they've, they've come from behind uh, a couple of occasions already, obviously against Newcastle again, um, where they were 3-1 down and they've had the character to come to come and uh, get a result. And, I mean, we saw that in the last game of last season, didn't we, um, mm. against Villa, that, that they're able to do it. And I think the only thing I think... Pet will be worried about really is when they come up against some of the better teams, they can't keep affording to ship goals because teams can hold out. The likes of Chelsea, um, who we've seen are well capable of shutting up shot uh, and being really dangerous on the break still. Um, teams like that who Man City have struggled in the last couple of seasons against yeah, Chelsea, it's just one big team to name. Um, I think they should be a little bit concerned about that. Uh, I'm sure, obviously, 
it'll be something that they're looking to eradicate but um definitely one to keep an eye on um because i feel i think that's a bit strange uh, ribbon diaz has looked a bit for me not like his old self um i'd say probably even the last couple of months um towards the end of last season he sort of lost his form a little bit and that defense just looks a little bit a little bit shaky to me yeah uh, I think, so I'm sure, I'm sure. I'm sure teams will feel that they can, you know, they can score a goal against City the way they are playing in the minute at the back. But you know, it's that that attack, isn't it? Really, <laughs> more than anything. Well, that's the um, thing. I think teams will be rewarded for getting at City, and I think Crystal Palace were in the first half. But again, like you say, if they don't try and stop Haaland dominating the defense, it's, it's difficult to contain them. So that's my next question, really. Tactically, how do you set up against this Man City team with the threat of Haaland? And also the the threats that are around him, um, there are so many of them from midfield. What do you do to kind of put the shackles on? Uh, I think it really rolls around our two key area, two, two key areas for me. It's the wings because we know how City like to kind of stay wide, especially those um, sort of inverted forwards they have kind of operating yeah. outside of Harlan. So you know they. You can't really have an off game and you can't afford um, to give them half a second because they will find those gaps. Um, another one's obviously in the midfield. They can obviously pass you to death and do that and teams are going to tie. And we saw it in this game. I, I just think Palace really started to tire. Yeah. Uh, especially it was, you know, you see it in the second half. As soon, as soon as they scored that goal, the kind of heads dropped and it was almost kind of inevitable what was going to happen with it. Yeah. Uh, moving on to Liverpool as well, if you can, because, I mean, we could talk all day about City and how they've been playing. They've been really impressive. But Liverpool licking their wounds a bit after a 2-1 defeat to United at Old Trafford last week. And they came back roaring. And I think you always had a feeling that they were going to have a bit of vengeance in a performance. But they came up against the Bournemouth side that have been really unlucky with the fixture list, I think, to begin this season, haven't they? But they were like lambs to the slaughter. Honestly, Liverpool winning 9-0, uh, equaling the record, obviously, set four times previously. What, what does this tell you about Liverpool now? Um, what does it tell you about Bournemouth? Is 9-0 a flattery result for them? What did you make of uh, that as a spectacle, Dave? Bit of a crazy one. I mean, didn't Bournemouth beat Villa? Yeah, on the opening day, wasn't it? <laughs> My was a bit like... You, man. Um... I just, yeah, they're, they're under-equipped, aren't they? Alexander-Arnold, brilliant ball in again! And Chris Meppen stuck out of boot! Uh, they, you know, even Scott Parker admitted before the game, Liverpool be looking to, you know, share a reaction today to obviously losing to United. But, like, that form of team, that surely I think they've got the favourites to go down. Yeah. They've not shown a great deal. For me so far, definitely need to get players in for transfer window shorts and you know, it might not be it's probably not gonna be enough them no. getting of two or three players in because not only do you need a good first level, you need squad depth and if you've not got those players to make a difference off of the bench. We've seen I did feel a bit for Scott Parker though, because I mean, I think he said after the game pretty much, you know, this result wasn't a surprise to him. He kind of expected it and even said it might happen again. So I think he's kind of making a message to the to his board that he needs reinforcements. But I mean, it's the wrong time to play Liverpool completely. And yeah, he's right. It was kind of inevitable. I think I saw a heavy scoreline, probably not on this uh, kind of level, but you could see it coming, couldn't you? I mean, the ironic... I mean, players now after that, you know? I mean, the ironic thing is obviously he's gone to Bournemouth, previously being at Fulham, who look a much better team. <laughs> Yeah, and you know the owners at Fulham seem to have been backing the manager there, giving him what he needs to you know to compete in this league, uh, and completely the opposite happening at Bournemouth. Um, so yeah, you got to feel for him. I think he said it's like the most painful day he's had as a manager yeah. player. So <laughs> that says that says a lot. Um, it's got it's embarrassing, isn't it? Really, so you have to go with that. Um, well, Jurgen Klopp looked a bit apologetic at the end, didn't he? A bit embarrassed for him. The fourth time, I think, the team scored had a result of 9-0, isn't it? 
in the Premier so, League. Yeah, you're right, actually. Southampton twice, uh, Ipswich against United back in 95. And yeah, this one is the fourth, actually. Yeah, so they never, no big team ever makes it to 10. But I feel like Liverpool could have got a, f- a couple of other goals during the game. Yeah. Fifth minute. They scored the ninth in the eighth, fifth minute. And you just kind of thought, well, it's going to be the day. But... Yeah. Yeah, it was set I mean, up. They scored a few quite early. We to see what the odds are for them not to concede for that last, uh, however much time was added on at the end, plus five minutes. Um, what odds you would have had? Because they just were leaking from from all over the place, really, weren't they? Yeah. Uh, you know, was... Absolutely shocking play from Bournemouth. Their defending was just suicidal. But I think after goal three and four went in quite early on. They kind of just gave up, didn't they? But Liverpool, interestingly, Mo Salah didn't score or assist any of the nine goals, which was was rare for him. Um, it's a weird one, isn't it? Because you can't really draw much from a 9 0 win, especially when it was so easy for them. But, I mean, they've got the Merseyside derby coming up as well. Surely Liverpool must be looking now and thinking there's a bit of momentum there after the, the awful start they've had. Yeah, definitely. And obviously, that's going to be a big game both sides, especially Everton, really. Obviously, the start of the event, it's, uh, and the nightmare, kind of. They're, they're, uh, it seems to be a little put up in the air with what's going on there, but with Anthony Gordon as well, obviously one of their key players, um, even at such a young age. Yeah. It's, it seems like he wants to move out. I think Lampard's got so much to sort out there. It's Nightmare, nightmare scenario. Can't <laughs> um, think any, you know, a manager that will want that job. I know we've said it over the years, haven't we? About you know, yeah. like United job, other jobs coming up, and you're thinking it's it's a manager's worst nightmare. There's very little reward at the moment with kind of what you've got to operate with the board. Um, obviously, what's gone on previous. So, yeah, I mean, it'd be fascinating to see what happens in that. Everton, I'm sure, will be eager to be on, uh, not on the same scoreline as uh, what Bournemouth had. But uh, yeah, well, they drew one all with Brentford, which wasn't a bad result considering the context of how the two teams have started the season. So they are grinding out points, but it feels like with Everton it is a complete grind, doesn't it? There's no attacking threat from them. So yeah, I'm, I worry for Lampard. I don't know what Lampard's style is yet. You know, he's never really achieved anything in the game he's kind of got jobs really handed to him he's been quite lucky in that respect so we've never seen apart from probably a brief spell at derby a lampard style of play so i don't know what he's aiming for at everton and that's the problem in some ways it's, they've not been convincing at all though i think that's the thing right. even when they've managed to get a result it's it's barely deserved or you know it's been uh, <laughs> i just yeah, I, I fear for them. We mentioned last week, didn't we? I think they will be down there. They'll be round and about if something doesn't change quickly. I know it's still early days, but you, you just don't know where it's going to come from. They obviously no. lost Allison, who I think is a bit of a bizarre transfer in grand scheme of things, considering he's he's been on the bench a lot for the Spurs, and you'd have thought you'd want to be going somewhere where you're going to get starting mm-hmm. place yeah. in, in the first eleven. So, I mean, what what are, it'd be interesting to see if Everton do anything more in the in the, in the coming days. If they do get rid of Anthony Gordon, they're going to need to make three or four signings for me. Yeah, it's, don't look, um, don't look up to it. Well, there's a few deals happening in the transfer market before the window shuts this week. So obviously, I think Anthony is almost confirmed for United. A reported 18 million euros for him or is it pounds it's um it's a high fee anyway um, eight, so... roughly 85 million pounds which is mm. ridiculous but ah uh, it goes back to saying you know apparently united could have had him cheaper if they have kind of solidified their interest earlier on in the market and said look we want him from you and yeah. i have had obviously a lot longer to to replace him and it just goes again to show what an absolute mess United are. Well, um, you can see making a difference, though. That's the thing. You look at some oh, of yeah. our forward play lately, and he could be a you know spark to ignite that forward line because Rashford yeah, wants to be a good signing. I think yeah. it is a good signing, but again, it's 
it's going back to the Fellaini signing, isn't it? It's we could have had him. Um, obviously, when he had a buyout clause in that was um, that we could have had him from, and we decided to let that run out, and then end up paying another fifteen million. It's just desperation, yeah. It does feel a bit desperate, but he's the right player in the right profile, but just the wrong price tag. And do you know what? I'll take that at the minute. I feel like we need just players that are going to work for us. And I think that will, will be the case. Because, I mean, I watched the United-Southampton game, um, a 1-0 win, pretty even game. Um, the difference being a Bruno Fernandes goal, really well taken. But I thought Marcus Rashford, again, in, in United's game was just anonymous. You know, after the way he performed against Liverpool, which was decent, much better, he just mm. disappeared again. So we need I, some creativity. I think with him, it's when he's not afforded space in behind, he looks like he's yeah. all at six, really. Uh, and I just feel like we need somebody with a bit more sort of um, a bit more now some bit more unpredictable um, IQ really uh, yeah. or like you uh, I feel like Anthony will come in and be able to do that you know obviously Ten Hag obviously knows what he's all about knows what he'll be able to bring to the team and it wouldn't surprise me to see Sancho Anthony and Martial, or if we bring another forward in, because yeah. it—I mean, it looks like Ronaldo is going to go. I don't know where he's going to go, but it looks pretty desperate at the moment, and he's getting yeah. linked happily a lot. Um, can't speak for them, but I think that's that'd be a mistake from them, really. <laughs> um, that's I'll a weird one because I could see Ronaldo making a difference in this game as well. It felt like most of the chances United created in the first half needed an out-and-out -out striker on the end of them. And yeah. it would have been perfect for it. But when he did come on, he looked, he lacked energy. Do you know what I mean? He looked like he was mentally not there. It's because it's not going to be, you know, it's not going to be motivated, is he? No. If he doesn't want to be at the club, like, there's not going to be any motivation. I know he obviously says otherwise, you know, so professional and all this and that, but if your mind's not in it, hmm. there's not really any point being there. And, yeah, I agree with what you're saying. Those chances where they fall to, you know, you want them to fall to an hour, but again, he doesn't offer us what we need from a forward. What I will say about United, though, is that one, well, a couple of players that looked better in this game against Southampton were Bruno Fernandes, who I thought took his goal really, really well, um, and Christian Eriksen. He, he looked like the kind of player we thought we were getting. Um, finally, looked like he settled into some kind of rhythm in the right position as well. Yeah, I think. The only thing we're lacking really is somebody who can control games and dictate tempo, uh, especially when it looked like Southampton was sort of in the ascendant. Just couldn't hold on to the ball. That was worrying. Uh, there's only so much coaching that can, you know, enable you to to be able to do that. And it, it, at the end of the day, if you've not got the personnel to do it, because mm. uh, McTominay is not going to be able to do that. Fred's not going to be able to do that. No. Ericsson's not really that sort of player. Uh, neither is Bruno. You know, Bruno, we know, can be wasteful with the ball um, at the best of times. So, whether we've then identified a player who's going to be able to do that for us in the future, but obviously, like, Dion is going to be that man. Mm. And, like, potentially could get in at one point, but obviously, that's amounted to nothing. And Casemiro is not really that sort of, you know, not really that sort of player either. So, something that they're going to have to resolve, whether that's going to be January next season. Because uh, we're not going to be... I don't think we can play that way without that sort of player. Uh, we can't play exactly how Ten Hag is going to want to. So he might just have to compromise and just hmm. find a way to get results, um, which is what we obviously what we need. Uh, but, it, we've, yeah, we've, we've struggled just to kind of control games. How many times have we said that over the last... Two or three years. <laughs> yeah. Having said that, I think you're right about uh, United having to probably switch the way they want to attack this season because Ten Hag, I think, is the right coach to to kind of switch that up. You know, I think he recognises when tactically we haven't got all the pieces that we need to do what he wants to do. And he did it against Liverpool to an extent. He just changed the style slightly to make it suit the opposition. I think that's probably what we're going to have to do without that key creative midfielder, you know. I think... We have seen, you know, there's been players in there who've looked improved. I can't want to mention Dallo, who looks yeah. a lot better um, in and out of possession. I think defensively, he's improved a lot. 
Uh, obviously, he got the assist in this game as well. So there's a lot of positives. Uh, some of the players that brought in, like the Lassie, obviously kept his place this game as well. He looked really solid. Uh, still, I still think he can improve going forward. I've seen he's quite adept and uh, defensively. So, I mean, there'll be a lot more to come, but I just think it's nailing down the basics and being able to kind of pro- provide a foundation, really, with this team and going from there because, you know, you don't want to try and run before, obviously, you learn to walk. So. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Um, let's talk about the Wesley Fafana derby, shall we? Chelsea 2, Leicester 1. Um, Fafana obviously not featuring, but he looks on his way to Chelsea. Chelsea winning, despite going down to 10 men, from a, an absolutely crazy Conor Gallagher double yellow card in the first half. Um, Leicester couldn't break them down. Leicester couldn't get the win. So they're rock bottom of the Premier League now. First of all, a word on, on Chelsea. What do you think to how, how they look? They look pretty resolute in the face of quite a lot of adversity. And Raheem Sterling got his first two goals for the club as well. Uh, what are your thoughts about Chelsea, Lou? I think one one thing to highlight is Mendy's looked a bit ropey at the start of this season. Uh, I think Chelsea were very fortunate not to be one down. Uh, obviously, where Mendy uh, made a bit of a mess of a, of a cross. And obviously, Leicester up scoring and got ruled out. I don't really know why. I can't really see. I thought that was really harsh. And I don't know whether it's kind of like the obviously the VAR has to be ruled as a you know absolute certain uh, you know kind of outstanding error. But I, I thought there was nothing wrong with that. I thought it was yeah. a, I thought it was a goal. Um, I thought it was a very harsh decision to disallow that goal. So Chelsea were probably fortunate to come away with a victory because on another day, if Leicester go ahead there, then who knows what happens? You know, that the confidence gets up and we've seen what Leicester can do when they've, they've got some confidence and they can really kind of sweep side to side. Uh, we forget how good they are so at the time when they play yeah. football. Yeah, it's great to see, great side to watch. We've just not seen it this season. Uh, and again, with the Harvey Barnes goal, you should, you should be keeping that out. It shouldn't be getting beat, isn't it? Mm. Uh, and it wasn't, it wasn't exactly, you know, close. It wasn't within 10 yards. Of, it was you know, 15, 15, 20 yards or so away from goal where he's taking that shot. And yeah, for me, I, I, he looks a bit rusty. Uh, and yeah. um, that's got to be a bit of a worry. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I think Chelsea also... They do need another defender as well because you know they're going to need to rotate the squad this season. I think their aging centre backs are not going to not going to cut it for the for the long haul. And also, a word on Raheem Sterling. Actually, I thought he took both his goals really well. But having said that, they do need a centre forward as well. They're lacking some focal point. We were talking about Erling Haaland, weren't we? And the difference he's made for the way City finish off chances now. Chelsea were needing that really, weren't they? And they've needed that most games this season. Yeah, I mean, it looks like he's sort of taken up that false nine sort of position for the, for the time being. Um, I don't really know where Chelsea are going with the, the transfer business, to be perfectly honest. I think. Yeah, it's a weird one. Um, Anthony Gordon for £60 million. That's ridiculous. <laughs> Considering he only had a real full, first full season last year uh, for Everton, um, I, I can't comprehend how that you can justify that as good business no. uh, considering what we've seen from him he's not really burst onto the scene in terms of not you know, really in the mold of how we saw Rooney or any of those sort of players come burst onto the scene and you thought these are a dead certain to be one of the best players in the world uh, he's still got a long way to go he's he really should be staying at Everton not in mind just kind of get first team football because you can easily go into that Chelsea team and all that squad and Google, mm. for instance, you know, might think, oh, actually, I'm not sure if he is what I want. And then you're in a mess all over again. We've seen it with Ross Barkley, um, went to obviously Chelsea and he's another one who kind of um, obviously got lost and, uh, yeah. Got released I, this week. Well, yeah. That's all you need to know. Danny Drinkwater. Okay. That's another one. 
Very true, yeah. I mean, it could be yeah, a, a career ender going to Chelsea in some ways, couldn't it? But talking about um, Leicester, uh, they played all right. They applied a lot of pressure to Chelsea, who held pretty firm uh, going down to 10 men. Uh, they're bottom of the table now, which doesn't seem like it. they're having a very good start to the season. Are you worried about them if they're self Farnage? Do you think that'll be they can focus and regroup and move on? Or is it more deep-rooted than just having to sell a player that doesn't want to be there? I don't know whether it's the thing for me is I don't know there's a lot of plant a lot of Leicester fans reading kind of you have a look on social media, a lot of people saying the managers, you know, run his course and change. Mm. But that's the weird thing for me now is someone comes in and they're in such a kind of precarious situation position in terms of like their finances. Who do they trust to come in and give, you know, funds to because they need work doing on the spot that's obviously a bit of depth uh, i'd say obviously definitely the attacker's position um so I, th- I think it's worrying in terms of that because yeah they don't want to be in a position where they are you know not in rotation even um because you've also got some players there who we don't really know if they actually want to be there or not. the likes of Tillemans, um, indeed, he obviously come back from an injury recently. He was being touted with a big move to, you know, one of the top six teams. So, yeah, it's worrying, especially obviously now for Farnes on the way out as well. Yeah, you can't. I'm sure some players sort of don't really know whether they're coming or going. What's there's a lot of there seems to be a lot of uncertainty for me, and that's a me that surely has put a lot of pre- a lot of pressure on most of those players in that team they kind of there must be a feeling of they need to perform and need to get results now especially with the, mm. the start had to the season it couldn't have gone any worse for them really um obviously I, don't got, think, you know, um, I don't know who they go for if they got rid of brendan rogers though that's the thing i don't know what kind of coach would be like you say stepping into a project that doesn't have any money to begin with and it's a, it's a bit of a doer upper, isn't it? The Leicester squad at the minute. There's a lot of changes that need to be made, a lot of sales and a lot of purchases to be made as well. So it's not something they can fix in a transfer window or two. You know, it's it's kind of more deep rooted. I mean, if they wanted to make a change to the manager, they should have done it. You know, before the start of the season, they, something should have had to change uh, there if they were going to do it. I just think it's too late uh, because that's going to put off potential you know managers that might come in especially with the uphill task that they've got now yeah uh, it, the best manager they could have had would, would be graham potter without uh, a step down at the minute yeah well exactly that, that the start that brighton have had to the season as well is gonna would make it even more difficult to get him out of that, you know that role uh, yeah brighton you know that what what's What's the incentive to go to Leicester at the moment? It's a t- yeah. It's, a, it's going to be an effort, and it's going to be a, either a job for an up and coming manager or a manager that's trying to build his reputation as it stands. And there's not many of those about. Probably Pochettino. Even Pochettino is going to require some cash to spend initially. So yeah, it's a tough one to call. I mean, again, you don't know whether you go into club, not really knowing whether you're going to have the players on your side, whether they're interested in staying at the club you print yeah. it's pretty upheaval from from the bottom you know um so it's not going to be an easy job forever if, if they do that make a change whoever goes in uh, yeah. like we already mentioned the funds we don't know they don't know if they'll have funds available either so yeah it, for me it is a bit worrying um when you look at it from a bigger picture yeah well, we mentioned Brighton there as well. They beat Leeds 1-0, so they continued their really impressive start to the season. Graham Potter, like you say, is probably coach of the moment right now, isn't he? Really impressive from him. Uh, and also Newcastle uh, drew one all with Wolves, and I think Newcastle are another one of those teams in um, a, a state of evolution, really. Alan San Maxim has scored an absolutely fantastic goal for them. Um, so, yeah, Newcastle, interesting season ahead for them. Brighton, interesting season ahead for them. West Ham's another one. They beat Aston Villa 1-0 to get off the bottom of the Premier League. 
a bit of a turning point for West Ham, hopefully as well. But I don't know what's going on at Villa. I wish Miles was here to talk about what uh, what's happening there because they look all over the place, don't they? I think it would have been on an even bigger rant than <laughs> we are, to be honest, in you know past months. But no, uh, yeah, I saw some of the game and they just looked toothless. Villa for me. Yeah. That's it. I think he, he's really kind of Stephen Gerrard sticking to keeping Coutinho on, who I think is injured at the moment now, isn't he? So he had mm-hmm. to put Buendia on earlier than he probably would have done. I think Buendia makes such a difference to the way Villa play, and for some reason he doesn't want him to start games, or he prefers Coutinho to play a more creative role. And I know Miles is a big uh, Buendia fan as well, but uh, Gerrard's just not really currying much favour with the Villa fans at the minute, is he? He's, um, he's a bit of a divisive character. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure. I think there's a lot of worry there among the other fans at the minute, just kind of the direction that they're going. We've obviously already mentioned his win rate while he's been at obviously Villa, and you know it's. Is there going to be any improvement? I don't know. How long does he get? Yeah. I think you you think about the the favourite to be sacked the managers. You'd think probably Frank Lampard and Steven Gerrard are going to be favourites at the minute. Yeah, well, I have Hasselhoodle as my favourite. And Ralph Hasselhoodle looks like he's actually shaping Southampton into a difficult team to beat, isn't he? But yeah, those two, they've got to be the favourites now, surely. I think the thing is, though, with Southampton, they have lost players, you know, over the years. Obviously, lost Danny um, They've had moments where they've had some shocking results. You speak of the two 9 nils that they've had, obviously, in the last couple of years, he had two you know, this manager is under serious pressure, but they couldn't, they, he just seems to be able to get a response from them. And I think that's encouraging for them. Yeah. So I, I don't think, I think they'll be, they'll be okay this week. This season. Talents have been linked with um, Gakpo from the um, PSV today as well. Apparently they're, in, they're willing to spend 40 odd million euros, which you wow. know, would be great signing for them if they if go and uh, make a couple of more acqu- acquisitions. Um, which I'm sure they will be looking to do. So, well, I mentioned Newcastle a minute ago with their draw, and they've been confirmed to sign Alexander Isaac from uh, Sociedad, isn't it? Um, for a silly fee, like sixty million pounds or something like that. I mean, he's a decent player, and I think he's great for their system. But they've had to overpay to get him, haven't they? I think that'll be a story of a lot of the transfers Newcastle do over the coming years, having to really pay over the odds to attract that kind of talent, but. What do you think he will add to the Newcastle attack? He's not the most prolific striker, but he's definitely a handful. No, he's you know from even from his days at Dortmund. Obviously, when he came in there, he was known to be, to be you know, a really good talent. Just whether he can fulfil his his potential, really. Um, yeah, he's not he's not the most prolific player, but he can kind of play all along that front line. Um, so he will offer sort of a lot of versatility. He's a really tricky player. Yeah, uh, to run at players, you know, score goals. So, I think it'll be a really good signing for them. It's just whether he can adapt to the league, really, because obviously we know Premier League is obviously a lot quicker than yeah, um, La Liga. So he will get less time on the ball. Whether he can deal with the physicality of it will, is another thing. So he will need time. He's still young as well. So yeah, uh, very true. I think, I think he could be a really good signing. Uh, it's a lot of money, like you mentioned, but you know, it's the market days that we're in now yeah. <laughs> we're not going to see any sort of value for money i don't think anymore no elsewhere in the premier league spurs beat forest away 2-0 um to continue their decent starts of the season as well but the standout team at the moment are arsenal they beat fulham 2-1 title credentials already do you think from arsenal this time last year we were saying they were relegation candidates they lost the first three games didn't they they were really struggling but big turnaround for them isn't it yeah, um, it's really encouraging, I think. For Arsenal fans, I think, just to get, have a good start to the season. Was it last year? Obviously, they lost to Brentford on the first day of the season, wasn't it? And it was. It looked like, you know, Awful. Arsenal fans wanted it to end already after the first game of the season. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think the, the, the signings they've made have been brilliant. Um, Jesus looking like real value for money, really, for what they got him from the City. Yeah. I don't know if Guardiola was trying to do him a favour there. Which <laughs> is little um relationship with um Arteta. But you know, he's we've seen that he can score goals in this league and 
he looks like he's enjoying being the main man. And Saliba has been he's had such a good start to the season. Yeah. Um, but yeah, obviously a bit of a lapse of concentration with with Mitrovic's goal. Um, but they've they've shown they're a threat at, at from set pieces as well. I think that's I don't know how many goals they've scored from set pieces already, but it seems like they've scored two or three this season at least. So uh, yeah, I'm I'm sure. I don't know how confident I am going. Is it this weekend when United play Arsenal? I think might well be. Yeah. Why do you feel that would be um, not quite a fifty-fifty? Then would you see Arsenal no, being the favourites for that one? The favourites, yeah. Um, we've we've got a lot of new. Saying that Arsenal have obviously got a couple of new players. Arsenal were after Lissandro Martinez. If they got him in. You know, they could they could have looked brilliant with the start that he's had at United. Um, so um, yeah, I, I I don't know if I go as far as saying title credentials, but. Definitely top four. Uh, they'll be looking to get into it, I'm sure. I would actually put money on Gabriel Jesus biting Man City in the arse when they face each other, I think. You know, I think he'd be really fired up for that one. And I think he's got a very good chance of actually scoring against them. So watch this space. Um, that's it for today's pod. We're going to wrap it up with um, Hero and Villain of the Week and obviously Goal of the Week, like we've been doing every week lately. So... Hero of the week, I think it's got to be Erling Haaland. Um, I think the way he transformed City in the second half and scored a really, really solid hat-trick um, to outline his strength, his credentials, if we didn't already know, and also the way he can change the way City play. So, yeah, Erling Haaland, definitely uh, the star of the week for me this week. I think you probably guess who my villain of the week is going to be. It's got to be Conor Gallagher, has after his, what, 25 minutes sending off cameo appearance. What an idiot. Like, he had his chance, didn't he? And, he, and he, he completely ruined it. I think it was probably just a bit of enthusiasm, maybe a bit of nerves got to him. Did you see mm. the, the yellow cards he picked up? Yeah, I think. But, you know, he's, you know, he's still a young player as well, though. I think, like you say, he's probably over-eager to make an impression. Yeah. I think he's probably had a lot of confidence from people, obviously, giving him that opportunity and, and maybe really want to kind of prove him right. So... Um, my goal of the week, I think, is a clear one. Alan San Maximan for Newcastle from distance. A slice clearance comes to San Maximan. That's the end of the pod. Thanks for joining us, guys. Thanks for joining me again, Dave. We'll have Miles back, I think, next week um, to pick through a really busy week of, of Premier League action, actually. There's games going on all the way through midweek, Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday. And the fixtures just keep piling up. But uh, yeah, we'll be there to talk about all of that and more. So join us then. Thank you so much for watching. See you soon, Dave. See you later. Cheers, mate.